All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm being told uh, we are ready to start. Uh, this is a really great crowd. Standing room only is a very good uh, problem to have. Your consolation, uh, people, uh, I'm sorry you don't get a chair, but you are by the bar. And the bar is open, so, uh, so there you go. I think you're actually the winners in this whole equation. Um, welcome to Mills Hardware, a dynamic new uh, event and entertainment space here in downtown Hamilton. Uh, we're glad you're here for a special community kickoff to, talk, uh, to kick off Super Crawl 2014, uh, if you ignore the fact that there were actually a couple of performances last night. Uh, this afternoon will feed your appetite for Made in Hamilton arts and design stories, and this weekend you'll experience it all firsthand as you crawl. I'm Keenan Loomis, President and CEO of the Hamilton Chamber of Commerce, and it is a true delight to be here and be your host this evening. Our event is titled Commerce and Architecture, and for me it's a particular thrill because when I was young, I actually wanted to be an architect. Um, I have all kinds of uh, floor plans that I did uh, when I was a kid of houses and, and stadiums and buildings. And uh, I, was, I was such a dork actually about uh, architecture um, that around eight, nine, ten years old, uh, my mother asked me what I wanted to be uh, one Halloween and I said, well, I want to be Frank Lloyd Wright. <laughs> You know, Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright has a very distinctive look. He's got the bushy hair and he had the tweed jackets, the, the three-piece suits and all of that. And she looked at me and she said, Keenan, I'm sorry, but uh, I don't think anybody's going to know who you are. And I'm thinking, why the hell not? He's the greatest American old, uh, architect of all time. Um, and so I was, uh, I was quite deflated at that moment, and I guess that's why I ultimately became a lawyer. Um, something that is far more acceptable in society, right? Um, during the next few hours, we'll explore the question, how do architecture and design drive economic development and redevelopment? This is a fascinating question, especially now as we uh, seek to reimagine uh, this city in terms of how it looks, feels, um, and in the shape of this city. I always say that uh, Hamilton has had a great past, but I actually believe, truly believe, that its future is greater than its past. And uh, that's why I'm here today. But how is that going to look? What is that future Hamilton going to look like? Um, obviously, we, we know we have a lot of great uh, fixed assets already here. Hopefully, we don't lose any more of them between now and, uh, and then. Uh, but we also know we have a lot of gaps to fill. Um, and in that space, without a doubt, architecture and design will play a role in a future Hamilton. So where does architecture end and creative place making begin? Uh, uh, we'll generate some answers through today's program and hopefully spark your interest to learn more. So let's start by acknowledging the key organizations behind the planning and promoting of this event. First of all, the Ontario Association of Architects, the Hamilton Burlington Society of Architects, the Renew Hamilton Project, a uh, Hamilton Chamber of Commerce initiative, our friends here at Mills Hardware, our team, uh, the team at Kim Graham and Associates, and of course, Supercall. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for all of those. <laughs> I'm happy to do my part in Supercall and participating in this, and I applaud the addition of this uh, community talks program to this rapidly expanding festival. Um, it's kind of, uh, for me, I think it's, it's cleansing to have this intellectual talk. It's like how I like to go to the gym on Friday afternoon so that I can do whatever I want for the rest of the weekend. So here we're, we're talking uh, <laughs> intellectual topic, and then we can, uh, of course, uh, celebrate uh, this weekend as we crawl. Last year's Supercrawl began with a talk by Tom Murphy, the former mayor of Pittsburgh, and I was there and I learned a hell of a lot. So much so that I'm, I'm continuing to take uh, some of those lessons that I learned from Tom uh, last year, and it continues to drive me forward in how I imagine uh, the city and how the Hamilton Chamber of Commerce plays a role in that future Hamilton that I talked about. He talked about the need for complex, um, a capacity for complex deal making when you are in a uh, when you are in a stage of renewal. And last year's uh, talk actually happened in, uh, at the Bank of Montreal space at the corner of uh, Jackson Square, uh, overlooking James Street. And we can't be there tonight uh, because, of course, McMaster is moving in. So uh, maybe it was a little bit of that super called fairy dust uh, that was sprinkled there that uh, made that happen. But part of what he was explaining was how institutions, key institutions in the, uh, in the community, play a role um, in renewal, and obviously we're seeing it now. The centerpiece of uh, this afternoon's program is a set of concise presentations by a number of speaker speakers active in architecture, design, and city building. 
And to help set the stage and tell us about similar events in other Ontario cities is Bird, uh, Bill Birdsell. Bill Birdsell is the president of the Ontario Association of Architects. He is also the owner of J. William Birdsell Architect, a full-service architectural firm. Bill's firm serves clients by designing multi-use urban structures containing highly finished housing units above urban, urban shops and services. These projects provide mid-rise, human-scaled urban environments that maintain lively communities. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm Hamilton welcome to Bill Birdsell. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. This is uh, the third event that we, uh, that the OAA put together um, in um, architecture as an economic driver. Um, in many cases, we felt that architecture is embodied by and filled by many lateral thinkers. And what a better way to get stories and discussions going than to bring together two groups, uh, Chamber of Commerce members and architects, and then add an interesting set of speakers with a local flavor to actually then stimulate the conversation and have the conversation carry on and hopefully carry on for the next few weeks uh, beyond this venue. This is the third event. We started in uh, KW in Kitchener at the Tannery, a similar historic building to here. And then our second event was in Ottawa. And now we're here and I'm very pleased to say this is definitely the the largest and most elaborate, so it's very good. So without further ado, I'll let uh, the speakers begin, and then perhaps many of us will be able to have a conversation after the event is moving into the next phase, the conversation and, and dialogue part. So thank you very much, and thank you for all coming up. Uh, thank you, Bill, and uh, congratulations on this important learning series. Our thanks go to the Ontario Association of Architects for selecting Hamilton as its host city for its annual conference, uh, 2015. So I'm sure you will all agree, Bill, I'm offering it right now. The entire community, we will do whatever it is you need uh, to make that a great and successful conference. So uh, call us right now, let us know what it is that uh, you need, and we'll do it for sure. Uh, and thank you for coming. So before we begin, uh, today's event organizers just wanted me to briefly touch upon um, what the Chamber of Commerce is doing uh, in renewal uh, to support our renewal efforts in, in this community. And I'd like to highlight three brief examples of uh, what we're doing as an organization uh, that is hopefully making a difference. Uh, first of all, uh, by showing our support for downtown, we moved downtown. Um, from our office in Jackson Square, uh, my predecessor David Adames moved the, uh, the chamber from the, uh, from the waterfront center to downtown a couple of years ago. From our office, we can see the uh, transformation of Hamilton happening before our eyes uh, out on King Street and, and over uh, by Catherine and, uh, and the Bay. And we are also part of the pulse of uh, what is truly a revived uh, Jackson Square. I'm amazed. Uh, between 10 and 5 every single day, uh, that mall is, is throbbing constantly with people moving about throughout, uh, throughout the, uh, um, the building. And uh, I actually had the opportunity to host um, an executive from a major uh, large retail uh, corporation, uh, host him for uh, lunch a couple weeks ago, and we walked through Jackson Square, and I didn't prompt him at all. It was about 1 o'clock, it was a random Tuesday, uh, and he, he turned to me within about 30 seconds and he said, wow, this is, this is crazy how many people are walking through here at, uh, at this time. And so it's, it's palpable and uh, it is indeed uh, quite uh, amazing what's, what's happening at Jackson Square. Uh, second, we're helping lead the conversation and incite action uh, through some of our initiatives like the Hamilton Economic Summit, um, as well as last year's first annual Ambitious City, uh, which featured Jennifer Keysmat, a Hamiltonian who is the head of the Toronto uh, Planning Department. Uh, we focus on urban issues that are important to our members and the community at large. Many of these issues speak directly to uh, the connection between smart design and commerce, including re-energizing Lower City Hamilton and engaging next generation entrepreneurs and young professionals. 
These conversations uh, and actions are also happening at the Hamilton Chamber of Commerce committee level. Uh, right now, for example, we have a task force called uh, the Commercial District and Neighborhood Renewal Task Force, where we are sitting down with uh, many key stakeholders in the community, businesses, not-for-profits, um, BIAs, uh, McMaster, uh, the City of Hamilton, and uh, we are helping McMaster Institute of Transportation and Logistic, uh, Logistics do a, uh, compile a research uh, study on uh, complete streets and how uh, complete streets uh, can lead to economic development opportunities uh, in the future. So we see this along with light rail transit as a critical step in reactivating commercial corridors citywide. And of course these co corridors are the building blocks for fresh architecture, new economic uses, and business development. And the third way in which we're playing a role as an organization um, is we're teaming up with a range of partners in a common cause to build Hamilton, the ambitious city. And this work, uh, which extends from helping small businesses uh, set up shop to reshaping our urban form, very large issues, uh, requires unprecedented teamwork. Uh, and our chamber is in the mix alongside the city, the Hamilton Burlington Society of Architects, uh, the Home Builders Association, the Realtors Association, again, other not-for-profits and businesses, and other key st stakeholders. We're in that mix um, and uh, through our Renew Hamilton project. And we have our finger on the pulse as, as to what's going on in this community. And we're trying to connect all these various initiatives into one large initiative um, to gain momentum. So now onto the main structure of uh, today's attraction. Uh, so seven Pecha Kucha talks by some prominent names in architecture and design and renewal are about to uh, to be revealed before you. Pecha Kucha is a Japanese term for the sound of conversation, chit chat in English. Pecha Kucha talks began in Tokyo over a decade ago and have spread to more than 700 cities worldwide. The format limits each speaker to 20 images and 20 seconds per image. The result is a con concise presentation that lasts no longer than six minutes and 40 seconds. The approach is simple. I'll introduce the speaker, they'll present, we'll be amazed and uh, applaud at uh, their presentation. Our AV team will load up the next talk and we'll repeat and we'll have fun. And then you will have the opportunity around the bar, I'm envisioning around, right over there, to, uh, to ask the, uh, the presenters questions about their, their presentation. The organizers selected speakers with varied, back, varied backgrounds and interests. Uh, we'll cover a whole range of topics from adaptive reuse and street design to sustainability and cultural vibrancy. And at the end of the talks, like I said, they'll uh, be available for your questions. Now, before we begin, I know this uh, format is challenging, and I appreciate uh, the participants for, uh, for participating in this, uh, in this uh, format. And uh, I know that they have uh, done, a, a, done a lot of work in preparation for today, and I know that they're getting a little bit out of their comfort zone in doing this. So before we start, why don't we give uh, uh, some applause for the, the people who are going to be presenting to us. I'll get to our first uh, speaker, and he is Richard Allen. Richard Allen is an award-winning social entrepreneur specializing in the development of sustainable communities. He is the founder and director of the Renew Hamilton Project, an initiative of the Hamilton Chamber of Commerce, which is focused on creating jobs and prosperity through the regeneration of Hamilton's built and natural environments. Richard leads a multidisciplinary team with expertise in community planning, engineering, business, and communications to revitalize and promote Hamilton's urban core. Prior to this role, Richard was the Managing Director of the Hamilton Economic Summit. Um, Richard also served as the Executive Director of the Industry Education Council of, of Hamilton, where he spearheaded myriad programs designed to enhance our city's human capital through collaboration among business, education, and community. Richard writes extensively on the topic of city building and economic development, and is active on various community organizations and boards, including the Hamilton Philharmonic Youth Orchestra. He's a graduate of Queen's University, holds a master's in education, and is the recipient of the Queen's Golden Jubilee Award. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard Allen. Over here? Oh. 
<laughs> I know, I know. It's a big day in our, our family today. My, my daughter is in grade seven, just got elected by her peers as a VP for her uh, school council. So it was so successful, I'm gonna present her speech tonight because it was such a, a winner. So we're gonna take 20 seconds per slide here and I'm the first person up and uh, we're gonna see how this goes. Echikucha. I want to thank Keenan, I want to thank Bill. Uh, cities change and evolve over time, and, and so do our local economies. Architecture and design really does reflect changes over periods of, of different forms of, of production. I wonder if this, is this moving here? It is. Okay, oh boy. There we go. It's amazing. So many people here tonight to explore all the different combinations in how we form our city. The economy, commerce, architecture and design, and how they combine to shape a wonderful experience that we call Hamilton. It says something about us that we're curious about our city, we're curious about the way that we live, and we're very curious about architecture. So my point comes down to four real key messages here. Cities rule, and we have to compete as cities for talent and investment around the world, and people really do need to love their cities. People need to love Hamilton externally and internally here if we're going to thrive as a city, and architecture counts in that. I come from an urban renewal perspective, as King had said, we document, promote, and accelerate uh, Hamilton's regeneration. And that's the vision of the Reno Hamilton Project. We're an initiative of the Hamilton Chamber of Commerce, and together we believe that inspired urban environments, jobs and prosperity go hand in hand. And that's the business of city building. City building changes over time, and markets certainly change over time. Past economic priorities shaped yesterday's urban form in Hamilton and gave us urban highways and sprawl. So what's the, what's the infrastructure of the new age? What's important now? Well, we believe that we need a new infrastructure in Hamilton, whether it be hard or soft. We need to foster human interaction, collaboration, generate ideas and innovation in Hamilton, support a service economy, and provide mobility for all. And so that's the foundation of our city moving forward and what lies ahead for Hamilton. Let's make some quick economic predictions for Hamilton 10, 20, 30 years out. We'll be an urban economy linked to strong downtowns all across our city. We'll be a sustainable economy with ties to a broader ecosystem, a creative economy, super crawl on steroids, an economy for small business with great global ambitions, and certainly a renewal economy. And this renewal economy is very important because it really is taking a look at it, rather our liabilities, taking a look at assets, whether they be built or natural environment. And it's a real obvious thing for Hamilton. Renewal begets renewal. And I haven't met anyone that doesn't like the renewal that's happening, for example, in our downtown and on our waterfront. Hamilton's new economy means a new business landscape for our city. We'll see more startups and growing sectors like social innovation, services related to aging and unique experiences, regional businesses linked to the greater Toronto uh, GTA, and mature businesses wanting to reboot. And that's where your McMaster and your um, other learning institutions come into play. And business development on our waterfront through development of real estate. The lower city building room is going to drive our economy and certainly revenue, particularly revenue per acre that will come into our tax stream. So that's very exciting going forward. Commerce and architecture, let's put the two together. So how might local architecture and design help drive this new economy in Hamilton and commerce in Hamilton? We believe that our local architecture will increasingly be about some of the principles that we embrace here. It'll be about people, putting people first, and planning and implementation because scale matters. It'll be about interaction, enabling people to connect and form relationships. And that's important, particularly as we age, social ties will be very important in diversity. Building mixed structures, neighborhoods, communities will be extremely important to us. Increasingly, local architecture in our community will be about High design standards that grab people's attention and ignite their imagination. Higher levels of density required to create the economic conditions for success that we all want and enabling improved mobility by car, public transit, foot, and bike. 
Other principles that we'll embrace going forward, increasingly our architecture will be about adaptive reuse, but in creative ways of blending historical and future elements together. Flexible spaces like this that allow it to have different shapes and forms and uses over, over the course of a day, and heritage, leveraging the extraordinary economic value that rests in our built and natural heritage in Hamilton. So, I just suggest, hug an architect, well, you've gone around the bar there, they'll really appreciate it. If we're going to invest in going forward as a design community, certainly work with your architects. They do the right thing and they do it very well. We're also encouraging you, if you want something to take out of tonight, certainly invest in learning. Learning about the continuous improvement is a way to engage yourselves and get active in the renewal of Hamilton. Many examples, the Architectural Society has their tactical urbanism, Cobalt Connects has wonderful events, and the Renew Hamilton project has a speaker series. In the past, we worked with Christopher Hume, and we'll carry that speaker series forward. Most importantly, engage many local platforms. I really like, and many of us that are involved in renewal, like the neighborhood action strategy that came out of the Hamilton, uh, city of Hamilton. Great best practices in bottom-up urban renewal happening in our neighborhoods. Wonderful way to get engaged. Barton and Tiffany and other studies are going to City Hall on September the 19th. I encourage you to be there. Visit other communities. Urbanicity gets aboard the bus and go to communities like Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Buffalo. We went to Cleveland, this t-shirt is great. Give me Cleveland or give me death, said, said this t-shirt when we visited there. So it was all about the pride and all about the love. So we encourage you to love our city. This is a couple that I met out by St. Mark's Church in downtown Hamilton. They lived in this community for years. So we have to be not only a community that loves, but also a community that's all about compassionate economy. And I think that we can do that through an inclusive approach. So I want to thank you, and I want to thank all of the people that are behind the Renew Hamilton Project, in addition to the Chamber, Downtown BIA, the Molinero Group, Historia Building Restoration, McMaster University, Core Urban Inc., Wilson Blanchard, the City of Hamilton, and the Province of Ontario. So I thank you very much. I hope that I've set a little bit of a stage in the long run for tonight's discussion. Go have a beer, you earned it. Thank you, Richard. All right, so now we are going to hear from Bill Curran, the principal of TCA Architects. So Bill is the principal of TCA Architects, located above the CBC and Design Annex on James North, in a building he redeveloped with two friends, the first of several redevelopment projects he has undertaken. He has practiced architecture, urban design, and interior design across Canada, the U.S., and the Caribbean. After being raised and working here, he went out to Toronto and the U.S., and he returned to Hamilton by choice in 2001. He lives in the North End with his wife in an adaptively reused 1870s home. His firm is responsible for Good Shepherd Square, the Lister Building, and Tourism Hamilton, the recent Ancaster Senior Center, and this adaptive reuse of 95 King from Strip Joint. Uh, I think the poll was right about here. <laughs> Uh, to uh, housing and arts center, among others. He is committed to making Hamilton better incrementally and is not afraid to put his money where his mouth is to make Hamilton better. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Curran. Hi, all. Uh, sorry. Everyone hear me now? Good. Am I out of the way? Yes. Good enough? Yeah. A little bit more? All right, I'll pull this over. Can you see okay now? There's nowhere to put my beer. I will have to survive. Thank you all for coming out. This is really gratifying. I wanted to talk uh, for my few minutes about the power of architecture uh, and the, really the power of design. It's more or less the same thing. And I wanted to, uh, yep, I'll get to it. No worries. Um, the, I just wanted to place a quote. Uh, you know, architecture is a cultural product. It, it is a, a result of many forces that work on us in our society. And if you look back at different parts of history, society built different kinds of buildings. And we continue to do that, and they reflect us. So we have no one to blame but ourselves for the buildings that surround us and that we live in. Um, to that note, Winston Churchill once said, we shape our buildings and thereafter they shape us. So the, the impact and the power of architecture on our lives uh, is huge. And if you think about 
uh, any building you've been in that's had that kind of mystical effect on you, whether it's a cathedral uh, or a particular restaurant or a house or a hotel, buildings can impact you and they can change you. And what we're advocating for here, obviously, is a higher quality of design. So in architecture, design is really problem solving and design is kind of an aspect of architecture. It bridges a gap between vision and reality and high quality design can accelerate innovation, it can accelerate entrepreneurship, it can help people and businesses outflank competition, it can create high economic value. So the question really is, what is the power of design? And I'll give you a few examples. Architecture can inspire. I don't know if anyone knows this building. Does anyone know it? A couple of people. It's a cultural center in Valencia, Spain. It's the next Bilbao Guggenheim. It's a very unusual building. It's very captivating, and I bet in five years you'll all know what it is. But it talks about the ability of architecture to define certain images. The power to inspire can come from architecture as well. We can see iconic buildings that we recognize, the pyramids, the Sagrada Familia in uh, Barcelona, uh, down below some work by uh, an amazing architect named Zaha Hadid, and of course, I think everyone knows Falling Water by Frank Lloyd Wright, a 1935 house. Architecture can define corporate culture, uh, whether it be a traditional office building like the Woolworth Building in New York, to more contemporary examples of what offices are starting to look and feel like. They're symbolic of the culture of, the, of a business or an organization, and they can set different values and send different messages depending on what you want it to be. These are some examples, again, of how architecture can set corporate identity. These buildings send very unusual, very different meanings about what they want to say. Oh, I caught up. <laughs> corporate identity isn't all of what architecture is about, but right now it's, it seems to be a, a, corporations are investing in architecture. On the left, the new headquarters of uh, Apple. Uh, the, uh, on the right, the uh, new Google headquarters. These are very unusual buildings for your traditional office building, and they're sending a different message about how corporate culture is changing. And right now, corporate culture uh, perhaps, uh, and, and maybe perhaps museums, are the cutting edge. Look at the way product design has revolutionized itself in the last decade or two. On the left, the Dyson vacuum. How many people don't know that image? The right, the Apple products. The power of design is profound, and it can have a huge impact. And architecture design can change our lives. It can change what we think of as a country's image. On the left, everyone knows the Sydney Opera House, I'm sure. On the bottom or to the right, some of the images of Dubai, uh, the new racetrack, Formula One racetrack comes through a hotel on the right. Some of the former stands, Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan, they're building buildings, dictators are building buildings to set a new clean, happy image for their culture. A, one building can change a region, it can change a city. This building in, uh, in Bilbao, Spain has changed Bilbao forever. They've had more than a million visitors, I think I probably am light on that, uh, in six years or eight years, something like that, from one building, notwithstanding the art within it. Power in architecture can define the image for other reasons, and maybe better images and corporate, corporate reasons. Academic dignity, this is um, Jim Basile's new uh, Center for Governance at the University of Waterloo, designed by uh, our own Hamilton uh, hero, Bruce Kuabera. It can also inspire students and the next generation in terms of projecting academic dignity and creating inspiring settings for education. Uh, our own DeGroote School of Business in the top left as a contrast to what quality academic institutions are doing elsewhere in the world. But there's an important lesson there. Why don't we have more of the other images? Why do we settle for the DeGroote School of Business? Cultural icons, similarly, that are putting cities on the map on the, on the, uh, the top, uh, Denver, the right, the ROM, the bottom left is the Berlin Jewish Museum. These are, you know, architecture making a mark on a culture. The bird's nest is the symbol of the, uh, the um, Beijing Olympics. I'm sure most of you know it. On the right, what it looks like today. It is falling apart, it is rotting, it is soiled. Because it was reflective of short-term goals of that culture. They were trying to project a certain image for two weeks. Architecture and the power of architecture has always been grabbed by religion and it has made some significant images in our mind compared to the typical North American church on the top. 
What does that say about our culture as opposed to previous cultures? The Hagia Sophia has been adapted from a Christian cathedral into a Muslim mosque, and now it's a museum. We can also use the power of architecture to mark horror and shame. I'm sure everyone knows Auschwitz, unfortunately. I'm sure everyone knows Vimy Ridge or the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. The other one is a Holocaust Museum in Miami. Architecture is a powerful tool if you invest in it and if you capitalize on its potential. Restaurateurs know about the power of architecture to create experience. How many restaurants have you been to that are in, like in the left middle, uh, just a banal little place? can still be fine. But these other kind of restaurants, the Towers of Wine that you now are seeing in Las Vegas and in London, uh, it's a different experience. Hotels have changed and seized upon the power of design. On the right, uh, in uh, near Bilbao, Spain, in the Rioja region, uh, Frank Gehry designed a small hotel that's phenomenal. On the left, some New York hotels, and then what we expect, the Hampton Inn along the QEW. <laughs> what does it say about us? Even youth hostels, bargain basement youth hostels are changing. This is a new hostel in Barcelona that is seizing on the power of design for 22-year-olds that are on a budget. 22-year-olds understand the power of design and the power of design to create experience. In terms of creating home, we can either do like the bottom image, which is probably pretty small to see. It's, it's a famed um, public housing project that lasted 10 years in St. Louis called Pruitt Igo. It was demolished within 10 years of being built because it was a, a gulag. The other buildings, the left building is actually a social housing project, but it was invested in design and in quality people's lives are enriched. The power of architecture and beauty can affect even industry, which used to build buildings like the top left, which is a Ford plant in Detroit. On the right, that's a gas plant in downtown uh, Brooklyn, right in the skyline of Manhattan. The bottom right, a BMW plant, a factory in Germany, and the bottom left, which was a Dusseldorf uh, VW plant. Even utilitarian structures, by uh, picking on the, the uh, Dalhousie Bridge in Halifax, have been transformed. Even, you know, there's new ideas about living on bridges again, like the famous Ponte Vecchio in Florence, and a new proposition for rehabbing it on the bottom right. Architecture is powerful, we just need to embrace it, and the questions to ask ourselves are, why don't we have more good design, and why do we accept living our lives in mediocre design? Great job, Bill. And clever way of cheating there, uh, not pressing the button until you're uh, a couple minutes into your preamble. But uh, that's okay. It was a good presentation. I next have the privilege of introducing Robert Friedman, uh, Principal of Friedman Urban Solutions, an urban design, planning, and development advisor with over 25 years of experience working in a variety of urban and suburban environments. Between 2002 and 2013, Robert was the Director of Urban Design for the City of Toronto where he took the lead on a number of major initiatives including the creation of design guidelines for mid-rise and tall buildings, citywide streetscape design standards and the establishment of the city's uh, design review panel. Prior to returning to Toronto in 2002, Mr. Friedman was an urban designer for nine years with UDA, a Pittsburgh-based design firm where he became an expert in the design charrette process working on initiatives over 20 cities across the U.S. Robert has a multidisciplinary background and holds degrees in urban design, architecture, and law. He is also a founding member and chairman of the Board of the Council of Canadian Urbanism, a board member of the Urban Land Institute, and is a frequent lecturer and writer on urban design, development, and planning issues. Robert Friedman. So I always find that uh, it's good to be a little manic before you do a Pecha Kucha because you have to get through, in my case, probably about 40 minutes of uh, material in, what is it, six minutes and whatever. So uh, I also find with Pecha Kucha that if you've been drinking, it's a lot more fun. <laughs> so I encourage you to go to the bar. Um, can I take a minute and a half as an introduction? So. <laughs> okay, manic. So, 
Uh, when I was asked to do this by the uh, OAA, I figured from an urban design and planning perspective, are there some studies out there that show there's a correlation between how cities are doing and how they should be doing and uh, economic growth? There are a couple that are from Britain. Conclusion, absolutely there is a correlation. Cities that are well designed are doing better at attracting the best and brightest from around the world. That always sounds better British accent. I have a connection to Hamilton. My grandfather was a dentist in the Lister block for 35 years, corner office, third floor. My mom and my uncle talk about the fact that they could not wait to leave Hamilton. Uh, that was the reputation. I watched the city kind of crumble through the 60s and 70s. Fast forward to today, couldn't be more different, right? There's a buzz in Hamilton. People that I talk to in Toronto, whether designers, artists, musicians, want to move here. Uh, and my mom and my uncle can't believe it when I tell them this. It really does have a buzz, uh, art, culture, uh, architecture, design. Everyone I think is familiar with Richard Florida, um, the creative class, he's actually ranked cities in Canada. Hamilton, this is from a few years ago, 16 out of 21 cities, so it's on the list, it's good, could be doing better. Uh, some of the other ones will flash by, some of the competition, uh, you see there Toronto at uh, uh, Vancouver, Ottawa, so made the list, doing all the right things, some room for improvement. We've heard about some of the other Rust Belt cities that are doing well. I spent 10 years of my life in Pittsburgh. When I got there, it was a bit of a mess. It has come back. Detroit's coming back. Cleveland's coming back. Buffalo's coming back. All of the same kind of bones, great architecture, great design that Hamilton has, uh, which is good news for Hamilton, but they're also the competition, right? The people from around the world are wanting to move to all these cities. That's your competition. Uh, among others. So what are the things, what are the urban design tools, the planning tools that these cities are using in order to lift themselves up? Uh, you can see them there, I won't read through them because I'll actually go through one, uh, one at a time, but it's things like density, transit, uh, paying attention to heritage. Uh, we're lucky in Ontario that we have actually, from a d density standpoint, really, really good uh, documents that, uh, that help us do our work. Right? We've got Places to Grow that talks about concentrating development, new development in already built up places. We've got the big move that talks about connecting all of those centres with great transit. Uh, of course, it's a $50 billion plan without any funding, but that's another story. Uh, from uh, uh, When you move into the cities themselves, here's uh, Toronto official plan, Hamilton official plan. They are full of absolutely the right language. It's all about concentrating density in nodes and corridors and making sure that you're connecting those nodes and corridors with great transit and protecting uh, the single family neighborhoods at the same time. Uh, it's really important if you're going to be doing density and encouraging density that you have guidelines. Not everyone loves density as you can see from these images, whether it was 1920s New York or 1990s, 2000s Toronto. It's really, really important to make sure that uh, people who are developing and designing in the city know what kinds of buildings uh, they should be building and how they best fit into their context. I was involved in creating both the tall building guidelines and the mid-rise guidelines in Toronto. Just some basic things. How far apart should the buildings be? What are the floor plates? What kind of setbacks? What are the uh, base building heights for mid-rise buildings? How can you design them so that they're not overcrowding their neighbors and you're getting sunshine on the streets? Public transit, cannot say enough about public transit. It's probably the number one issue in the upcoming uh, elections in October. Politicians love to talk about transit. Wouldn't it be great if politicians started building transit? So I know sometimes that goes beyond city, uh, city politics uh, into provincial politics, but vote for whoever says they're gonna build uh, transit and who you believe is going to build transit. Multimodal tra transportation, I think it's already been mentioned here. Streets are no longer just about moving cars, it's about moving people. You wanna have complete streets in the diagrams you see there. Uh, much wider sidewalks that need to be designed. Uh, you wanna get people, uh, Young people are no longer buying cars, you want to get them on bikes, you want to get them walking, like in Copenhagen, over 50% of the people there uh, using bicycles now to commute. Uh, if you're gonna have great streets, they need to be designed, they don't just happen. Wider sidewalks and the images you see there, really good tree planting standards. Um, make sure that the sidewalks have zones for all the things that happen on them. Uh, and again, that doesn't happen just by itself, it needs to be designed. Mixed use, this is almost a given now, you don't even have to mention it, but there was a time in the, in the 60s and 70s Zoning spread all the uses apart. Uh, very much now, everything needs to be mixed together, commercial, residential. Um, if you want to have vibrant streets, you've got to have all those, uh, all those uses happening together, getting people in, uh, concentrated in one place. Heritage, um, I probably get uh, beat up by some heritage purists, but I love the way that Gene Jacob talks about this. It's about old buildings. It's not just about putting uh, heritage buildings on a pedestal. You cannot erase 
your past, you really want to build on it, and you want to do everything that you can to make sure that you incorporate old buildings, whether it's fixing them up beautifully or just making sure that you have some old buildings in the city. Um, and more on that uh, afterwards. Design excellence. It's amazing how much of a difference when, uh, when Mayor Miller was mayor in Toronto. A simple statement like, Toronto has had enough of good enough. That made my job so much easier. We started doing design competitions, we started doing uh, design charrettes, all those sorts of things, having political support for it and a simple statement that supports it. Unbelievable. Um, one of the things that we did to raise the bar in design was uh, start a design review panel. We started by having a, um, uh, a symposium where we invited people from panels across the world, got some great ideas, set it up. It was very controversial at first, but OAA wasn't too pleased. Uh, over time, it's become very well accepted and, and uh, I think he's doing a great, great job uh, raising the bar in design. Uh, it's all about volunteer designers. It's advisory to city staff that is not making decisions. And the earlier in the process you get a project in front of the panel, obviously the easier it's going to be to, uh, to have a good effect. Uh, there is a panel now in Hamilton. I, uh, I sit on that panel. Uh, they've done all the right things in terms of the way it's been set up, in my opinion. Uh, a little surprised at some of the headlines that have come out. It's not so much about preventing bad buildings as I like to think as it is about encouraging great design. That's the role of a panel, and it should be getting people talking about great design. Uh, and finally, maybe I'll take a breath. Um, in terms of adding value through design, uh, the check marks are there, right? All of these things, there are probably a list of another 20. Hamilton is already doing them. You can see by the size of the check marks, they're doing some things better and more than others. Um, could use some really good design guidelines, could use some more transit. Uh, but in general, I think Hamilton has definitely got a buzz. It is on its way up. Uh, and if my wife would let me, I'd move here. Thank you. <laughs> I tried to use the other one, it didn't work. Um, thank you very much, Robert, and we would love to have you and your wife move here, please. Uh, I know a good realtor, and there are some really great homes, especially in my neighborhood, that are up for sale. Uh, next up, we have Jeremy Freiberger, Chief Connector and Cultural Strategist for Cobalt Connects. Jeremy has been a leader in Hamilton's creative community for almost 15 years. After studying theater and music at McMaster University and the American Music and Dramatic Academy, Jeremy returned to Hamilton and has worked at a number of, of the community's major art institutions. His experience ranges from touring the country as a musician to producing international caliber ballet, to developing studio facilities, to writing policy plans and funding applications for municipalities and organizations. Focusing primarily on regional municipal partnership development and creative sector development, Jeremy is the chief connector and cultural strategist and founder of Cobalt Connects. Ladies and gentlemen, a friend of yours and mine, Jeremy Freiberg. By the slide, I've been given an instant job promotion. Somehow, I've now become a principal at a firm. It's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> uh, my name's Jeremy. I'm the guy that thought this event was tomorrow, so my apologies to the event organizers for giving you all the headache, uh, heart attack, before I arrived about five minutes before you all started. I'll dive in. There we go. Uh, I run an organization called Cobalt Connects, and we're going to talk about the ups and downs of neighborhood assessment through a research project where about 75% of the way through. We're a weird organization in that we don't actually create any culture ourselves. We help other people create culture and help municipalities sort of evaluate and assess what they're doing and what their role in culture is. So we do a lot of stuff called cultural planning, which usually ends up in a whole pile of dots all over all sorts of maps and neighborhoods where people start to assign value to the things that they see and do and love about where they live. And that can be anything from a memory of a place to a physical building, a piece of architecture, to an event they go to, to a gallery they love, or a place that they participate in creating value. And in a lot of new cultural plans in our province, about 100 have been written in the last five years, the word vibrancy showed up as the new thing we want everything to be. Vibrant people, vibrant neighborhoods, vibrant cities. And our concern as an organization is that people like this who are running to run our city all probably have a different definition of what vibrant means. Each of you probably has a different definition. So we created a research project called Expressing Vibrancy that's about helping a community understand the elements that make up what they consider vibrant. And in this case, we were looking specifically at what makes up their visual environment and what they see in a neighborhood that says, 
When I arrive here, this is a vibrant space. If we want that, we have to be able to assess it. So we started by doing what we're calling the first stage, which was called taking stock. We went through eight different neighborhoods in Hamilton and counted about all of the things you can count. How many stores are there? What kind of architecture do they have? Garbage cans, benches, signs in different languages, cultural institutions, schools, museums, libraries. You name it, we went and counted light poles, all sorts of stuff. So we got an idea of what's in that physical space and what it looks like. We then gathered up about 250 people between the ages of 13 and 84 to walk through those neighborhoods and fill out a survey so they could tell us the qualitative stuff they see. What are people doing? How do they feel? What are they responding to when they're in that space? And is that adding or detracting from what makes it vibrant? We then partnered with two labs at McMaster, one of which has a really fancy camera, the thing that makes up Google Earth, the images you look at, but it's video, it moves. So we can drive you through a neighborhood and you can look wherever you want to look and see a place in its real environment as much as we can make it. Once we finished taking video of all different kinds, we took you to a really cool space at McMaster called the Live Lab, a facility the only one of its kind in the world. A hundred seat movie theater, while you're watching what's going on on the screen, we're monitoring your brain with an EEG, we're checking your heart rate to see what's making you excited, we're checking whether you're sweating, whether your heart's beating faster. We want to know what's grabbing you, we want to get a scientific sense of what's making you vibrant. What does that leave us with? A madness of charts of numbers. <laughs> and a whole pile of information about what you love about a space. We've now spent about six months diving into that stuff to figure out what are different people responding to. What do 14 year olds like? What do seniors like? What do men and women like differently? And the tricky thing with doing a study like this is at the end of the day, nine times out of 10, people want you to put a number on something. They want to know what your clout score is or whether you're a code red or not. They want to know if they're walkable or not and they want a number. The danger in a number is it tells me that you're better than you and that's the last thing we want to do when we're talking about culture. We want to talk about the uniqueness of each of the spaces. So working with a group called Factory Design who's over on Lock Street, we've taken all of the data that we've gathered and tried to make it visual without scoring it. So that you can look at it and see that neighborhoods are different and depending on what you want to find in your neighborhood, you can choose a different one. Maybe you love green space. Maybe you love heritage architecture. Maybe you love a space that's got no bus stops. We can tell you which one it is now. We can also take all the qualitative stuff you said about a neighborhood. Do I love it, hate it? You like the color green more than the color blue? You think spaces are friendly? We look for language that people used about each neighborhood. Now you can go sift through those eight neighborhoods and say, I want to know what 14-year-old men said. Or I want to know what 86-year-old women said. What's the language they're using around those neighborhoods so we can get a sense qualitatively of how you feel. The other thing we did is we had a slider that people could move around while they watched a minute, a two-minute video of each neighborhood. And it turned out a thing like this. I'm not going to tell you which neighborhood is which line, but obviously some score differently than others. The last thing we want to talk about is which one did better or worse. What we want to talk about are the things that happen in the circles. What makes different kinds of people say yes or no to what they're seeing? I don't care where they happen. What are those moments? We're now starting to break down what are those moments of up and down creativity and vibrancy in a neighborhood. And wow, does it tell us some weird stuff. <laughs> so, Hamilton, a highly divisive city. 97.7% .7 of you between the ages of 13 and 84 agree that air quality is your number one rated cultural asset. If you do not have air quality, you're not in the city you want to be in. That's pretty unanimous in my books. How do we design neighborhoods and buildings to encourage positive air quality? If you're 50 meters away from an artillery road, your air quality is guaranteed to be 300% worse than somewhere else. We're near one right now. How do we all feel about that? Urban design, huge factors, everything from what our other folks had said, widths of sidewalks, how are we planting trees, where's the nearest bus stop? Which way are buildings facing or not facing onto a street? Are there alleyways? All sorts of weird stuff. From an architecture perspective, we've learned that the positive effect of heritage buildings being in a neighborhood does not override the negative effect of vacant buildings. You can have as many, vacant, as many heritage buildings you want in a row, 35% of people are going to rate the neighborhood worse if there's one vacant building. So the next stage for us is to start really diving into what different demographics think about neighborhoods and figure out how we can share that knowledge with you through reports. We're going to do a traveling exhibition to tour it around the city, hopefully around the province, and then create community toolkits where we can actually say what issues that we've discovered are issues that we can solve and which ones are ones that we need a municipality to do. We're still figuring out which ones are which. If you can go to our website, you'll figure out what we learn in a couple of months. Thanks a lot.
All right. And now we have Drew Hauser, uh, principal of McCallum Sather Architects. Uh, Drew Hauser graduated with high distinction from Carleton University School of Architecture in 1999 after receiving his honors degree in visual arts from the University of Western Ontario in 1994. I think it is Western University now, is it not? Come on, you're not uh, following the guidelines. Uh, he also studied architecture at the University of Pretoria in South Africa and participated in study abroad programs in Greece and Rome. With over 10 years of working experience, Drew has headed many projects in various sectors, including multi-unit, residential, pharmaceutical, biosciences, institutional, hospitality, retail, and urban design. Drew Hutt. I even wore blue laces for everyone. Um, thank you very much. I guess I have to press the button to start. All right, I have 20 seconds to talk, and I talked to everyone at the office and said, what if I run out of things to say? And they said, that's never happened, so I'm sure it won't tonight either. But thank you everyone for coming out and participating in this event, supporting the HBSA, and please remember earlier on to give your architects a hug later on. Uh, my wife's here, so I'm looking forward to that later. Um, renewal, architect's role, and I, I went into business and to renewal, but the architect's role is to share knowledge. We are generators of knowledge, we need to share knowledge, we need to share our experiences that we have with our clients. And I also followed the Pecha Kucha rules, which was to use your own images, at least that's what I read online. So this first image is 541 Barton Eatery. It's a building that I own, and I with a very knowledgeable and fun group who wanted to put in a social enterprise at this site. Um, their success criteria in getting there was to create new jobs and to create kind of a vibe in a neighborhood that was kind of failing or falling. So they ended up hiring our firm, which was kind of nice, being the building owner, and we worked on it to create a place where a neighborhood could meet. What attracted me here was the heritage architecture, and I didn't want to see it fall into the hands of someone else, and nothing happened with the site. Now it's fully occupied, and it actually makes money, and it's doing well for this neighborhood. The next slide is Victoria Park. Our firm worked with landscape architects, urban planners, and the city of Hamilton to really look at gateway and parts of community. How do we bring them back to life? How do we bring pride to neighborhoods that may have fallen a little bit? So when I first moved here, this project was happening and it was one of the cards, or one of the things that really drew me to the area. This being um, the Connolly, this was uh, the James Street Baptist Church. Again, looking at heritage, looking at buildings that are falling down, how do we save them or reinvent them for the future to make them into something exciting and new? How do we make them places where people can meet, people can gather? So the, this really, um, on the next slide, is how we bring, we extroverted the space and we reinvented and repurposed parts of the existing building into dynamic spaces inside where we were able to repurpose stained glass, columns, and then create new spaces for people to meet that opened up into the street. Another project similar to that is the Tivoli, um, where this really has it all. You've got your culture renewal, your heritage um, uh, conservation, and then of course the business of city building. Here, we, we create all these things in a new dynamic uh, center. We connect things to the street. We also make them accessible and, and kind of exciting for a neighborhood. Also, the businesses here, in, in looking at that, there's going to be new residences, small on, on the scale of this project, but uh, enough people that it'll make it easier for businesses in that neighborhood to survive and, and avoid those empty storefronts that were talked about in, in Jeremy's slides. Precedent setting, well, that's always exciting, and architects love to be involved with that because it's, it's really a challenge. It's not building something that's uh, already been done. Um, one of the projects that's been spoken a lot about tonight um, was Music in the Mind, and we, we were definitely a part of that. Um, also, using that technology that we have out there and trying to recreate it into something new. This one was a precedent-setting uh, precedent project I, we did, or I did years ago in Toronto. Um, it was a laneway house that I built um, off of a 15 by 15 foot garage that was there. And it was how someone can live in a neighborhood in a 22 foot by 22 foot house 
Um, and it's been really well received by that neighborhood and a lot of other buildings there. Also, this is the Fraunhofer Project Center, a project we did at Western University uh, since the name change. Um, this was with a German client. It's the first of its kind in Canada where we were building, a, learning a process of how um, they build and how they research and then translating that into architecture. This is music in the mind that Jeremy was talking about. Uh, it's a, uh, again, an enlightened board and an enlightened group of users who really shared their knowledge with us and how do you translate that knowledge into something special and what does it mean locally and what does it mean then nationally and internationally. Um, and that was great that they hired a local architect for that project. This is another project where Again, new technology and trying to figure out how much is too much or too little and really knowing your neighborhood and knowing your client makes you a powerful architect. So instead of trying to do everything, try and do a few things really, really well. So uh, this slide, design and business, so which one comes first and that's kind of back and forth because in some cases um, the business plan is there and design comes after or in the case of say 541, the building was already built, it was a beautiful building. What kind of business will survive there? These are all um, buildings that I have personally owned and developed with my wife. Um, there's a few not there. Some of them we still own, some of them we've sold, but we're not just, um, we're actually investing in ourselves and in our cities. Um, architects aren't just there sitting on a, on a podium, you know, telling you what to do, but many of us take the risks to do it ourselves. This is uh, the Phoenix Pub at uh, McMaster University. Um, it was the refectory hall, so it was, it's really changed. An interesting part of the heritage component of this is it's all reversible. So if it ever did go back to the original refectory use, it could go back. And this is the um, heritage landscape associated with it. So it's now become an, a, a people place within that campus. And their success criteria was to create jobs, create activity um, that was sustainable within, within um, that part of the um, university and give it some identity. And, it, and it's been very successful and it's won uh, several awards. And the Dundas Museum, one of my favorite projects I've worked on in a while, the, the board was so wonderful and they were willing to take risks and, and really trust us. And I, and I will say, if you find the right architect, um, and I'm sure many of you, if you haven't hired one, you should, but that trust, you know, it's earned, it's respected, um, listening to budgets, listening to your client, and really understanding what they want and what their needs are at the end is absolutely critical. This project, um, they had to give you some metrics, 200 and, or 185% increase um, in the people attending their museum since they opened. Uh, they've had all sorts of new community partnerships and it's been amazing for them. So thank you very much for your time. All right, we are at our penultimate speaker, Joanne McCallum, director of McCallum Sather Architects. After graduating from the University of Calgary in uh, 1983 with a master's degree in environmental design and architecture, Joanne worked for several years in Alberta and Ontario before establishing Joanne Sather uh, McCallum Architect in 1992. The success of the firm resulted from a clear commitment to design excellence, client-driven service, and the integration of sustainable design principles into the design and construction process. In 1996, the firm evolved into the partnership of McCallum Sather Architects Incorporated and has continued a national reputation for highly innovative projects. Ladies and gentlemen, Joanne McCallum. minutes with my jaw clenched the way I have because I can't speak as fast as these gentlemen <laughs> and they've all been so great so I hope you all have a drink and if you don't have a drink would you please go get me? <laughs> because you get me for six minutes now um, anyway we'll start just uh, a little bit about myself very briefly my passion has always been about sustainability I grew up on the shores of Lake Huron and uh, during the, I'm going to say, in the late 60s, early 70s, so now you know how old I am. And uh, I watched how 
the lake was degrading as I was growing up as a teenager. And that has been the root of what I have uh, focused on for the rest of my professional career. Um, environmental sustainability really relates to three things. It relates uh, not just to the environment itself, but it also talks about the financial implications and social and cultural implications. So those are the three tenets of environmental sustainability. Um, what I'm showing you here is a, a project from uh, Waterloo that we did for Waterloo North Hydro and you really see kind of the impact of the, the uh, landscaping, the xeroscaping, really using a lot of drought resistant uh, plant material. A very obviously a well lit uh, building, it is a LEED certified building, LEED Silver. Inside uh, has tremendous amount of natural light, it's an administration headquarters as well as a fleet headquarters. And you see the wood there is recycled elm from barn, uh, barn board that we are integrated into it. And it's just a phenomenally great place. A lot of local materials, uh, natural materials used in the, in the interior. This you might be familiar with. It's here in Hamilton, the North Hamilton Community Health Center. I want to say what a great organization they are. Fantastic. They embrace sustainability. They embrace LEED. And they never, ever let us drop the ball all the way through this project. It is a LEED Gold certified uh, building. It has a lot of, uh, you know, primary health care, rehab, chiropody, community kitchen, and it has a high performance enclosure. It has about 40% energy savings uh, in the building itself. So I think, you know, this is really when you're walking the talk, when a, a health center actually embodies sustainability and integrates that into their building. This particular project uh, we built a number of years ago, I mean not necessarily a real sexy looking building, but I'll tell you it was the first LEED gold building in Canada with the CAGBC. And uh, all of the water that is harvested here is used for cleaning the, uh, the, um, the fleet uh, facility that is housed in here. They have a tremendous amount of natural light that comes into the actual operations center. And there you can see the fleet. And uh, we had uh, about 50% plus energy savings in this building. And one of the largest solar arrays at the time was put on this building as well. So it, was, uh, it set a whole new standard for this uh, region of Waterloo. This is uh, probably, I think, the first lead facility that the city of Hamilton did. It is the Woodward Avenue uh, uh, Environmental Labs. We have, again, a lead silver certified building. Um, we have uh, operable clerestory windows that uh, come on at a certain time when the, to just release the uh, heat from the building. And really, this is all about sustainable sites. This is what we do. Uh, we, tr we don't actually pipe our water away into the sanitary and the storm systems. We try to deal with it all on site. All of our infrastructure in the city now is aging tremendously. So why do we keep building the same things and creating the same problems for future generations? And the thing that's really interesting to me about sustainability is it makes so much financial sense. It's, it's one of the things that has just completely confused me for the last two decades as to why we are not building sustainable. When you can save money operationally and uh, many other ways in terms of financial sense. This particular building, the rehab hospital here in Hamilton, uh, was built, just completed in 2009, 2010. We estimated that the annual energy savings from this building would be approximately $100,000 over the model national energy code. We used a lot of uh, natural materials, of course, in the building. Here you see just an example of the bridge that connects the hospital to the general hospital. It, uh, it's just concrete. We used a lot of just polished concrete floor throughout. Not low uh, off-gassing materials throughout the building. We integrated some old pieces of steel uh, that we found on the site as well that were part of the history of that site. Here we have a 27-story um, condominium at Mimico. This is really about supporting sustainability in the transportation hub. This is right at the GO station. So you literally can come out of the city, get on, you know, off the train and up into your unit. Um, has a complex kind of geothermal uh, energy system here. And they estimated that the condo fees and the maintenance fees will be about 30% less than you would typically find. So here's every unit owner is going to benefit from sustainability and, and paying attention to the details. The, uh, there's also a social impact uh, with sustainability and it's really about creating robust communities. It's really about designing in place 
And I'll just put a plug. I wish purchasing departments would understand that hiring local architects is very sustainable for their community because we hire a lot of people. Yeah. So, so I'm actually going to take you out to the Northwest Territories for this one. It's all about being rooted in place. This is a design which is going to be built next spring using uh, taking a total advantage of the site but at the same time really respecting the extreme climate they have and using materials and putting our windows etc in such a manner that they don't get uh, too much heat gain this summer when they've got 22 hours of sunlight and having a high performance enclosure and it's all a panelized system that is going to be uh, used for the exterior enclosure so it will really have a minimal impact on a very uh, challenging site to build on. The other social thing uh, we're showing here is this is the um, uh, library at the uh, the Faculty of Health Sciences Library at McMaster University. Uh, we blew open that whole window. It's created an amazing social space for the students there. But being somewhat environmentally responsible, those windows are actually probably the largest double glazed uh, windows that I'm aware of that has a, a warm edge spacer in the window to kind of reduce the thermal bridging of the actual glass itself. This uh, has become one of the most popular gathering places on the campus in terms of uh, using the library. People didn't even know it was there before. So that's it. I actually got through my, uh, my slides without too much embarrassment, so thank you very much. All right, and now on to our last speaker, David Premi, owner of David Premi Architects. David Premi is the principal at David Premi Architects in Hamilton. Throughout his career, he has been recipient of numerous national design awards, most recently in connection with the renovation and rebranding of the Hamilton Public Library and Farmer's Market in Hamilton. In past lives, David has written and directed short films, acted on stage, and was one of the founding directors of the Cabbage Town Theatre Company in Toronto. He is a passionate advocate for Hamilton and for the vital role of the arts in the, in the city's renewal he is a close neighbor of mine and a good friend. Thank you very much for coming, David Premi. Welcome. Lucky me, I get to go last. The new municipal economy means that we are in competition with other municipalities. We're, the product that we're offering is lifestyle. So our product needs to be better than that offered by our competitors so that our clients will buy from us. But who are these clients? What is it, who is it that we're marketing to? These are the people that we're marketing to. They're young professionals. I think my slides are not changing here. Lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> we're a little stuck. I guess I get 40 seconds per slide. Um, these are the people we're marketing to, young professionals, knowledge workers, innovation workers, Gen Xers, Gen Yers, whatever you want to call them. Studies show that these people choose a place to live and a quality of life over economic opportunity. They make their own jobs. So let's look at how this works. The economy is directly dependent on the quality of space, which is directly dependent on quality of design, which relies on a supportive design culture. So, if we want to build a sustainable economy and robust economy, we have to look at building a sustainable design culture. Quality of space, this is a familiar view of Main Street in Hamilton. Physically it's okay, it has some nice buildings, historical buildings, nice proportions, but design decisions have been made over the use over the years to prioritize cars. So the message is clear to pedestrians, you're not really welcome here. Let's look at a similar street, same proportions, nice buildings, this time it's in Paris. Different design decisions have been made here to uh, prioritize the and character of the street. So I think no one would uh, argue that there's more economic activity in this slide. So design is not only about visual things. When you're designing a building, a park, a bylaw, or an application process, you have to employ good design, and it must address social and cultural and environmental needs as well as the uh, uh, financial needs. 
And we also have to design the design culture. So we were commissioned to renovate the library and farmer's market. We were asked to connect the two uses as well as connecting the street. We were asked to create a new and contemporary identity. So generally it's been exceptionally well received, but there are some detractors amongst the cynical in Hamilton. Here's what the rest of the world said. We made the cover of two major North American design journals, two major provincial awards, one major national award, and we have just learned that we were announced as one of the 110 recipients of the International Design Award from the Chicago Anthenaeum this year. But we did not win a Hamilton Design Award. So that begs the question, does Hamilton have a supportive design culture? Well, yes and no. On one hand, we're known as conservative and bureaucratic, afraid of change and obsessed with rules. On the other, we're seen by some as a place desperate for any kind of development, regardless of quality or appropriateness. Somewhere in the middle is where we should be, the culture that we need. This is one of our private residence projects. It's been widely supported by community and city staff during its inception. With this support, we felt encouraged to take design risks while respecting the historical patterns of the street. And this dialogue continues today. We're constantly talking with neighbors and passers-by. This is the first glimpse of a mid-rise development at Cathedral Place on James Street. And it shows early attempts to respond to the existing fabric on Houston Street. Again, staff and council have been incredibly supportive, and the next steps are design review and public engagement before any real design happens, because I believe the community must be engaged. Uh, this is the Seed Works, which you may be, in, in, um, you may be familiar with. Uh, since Jeff Feswick and I developed this property, we've seen an uptick in the uh, housing market in the area, new projects new two-way conversions, uh, a two-way bike lane, and lots of potential. So this has become a hub of renewal and a collection of very innovative companies. But despite its transformative contribution, this project did not qualify for downtown renewal incentives or grants. So this is a design issue that we need to address. Here's another example of how we can do things better. We were delighted to know that our, our design of the farmer's market would inform and drive a streetscape project. So we designed a building that would go right across the street to York Boulevard and have a special design. Um, in the end, the mechanisms were not there in the city and the standard streetscape was slammed down in front of the building and really robbing the public of a value, valuable and potentially transform, transformative public space. So there's room for improvement. That's our design challenge. How can we communicate to developers what we will embrace as a community and when we will say no thanks? That's not what we want. That's not who we are. So the next steps, design review. That gets a check, we already have it. Lobbyist registry, so the process isn't interfered with. That gets a check. Public pre-consultation before designs are a foregone conclusion. That's in the works. Um, supportive planning. That's in the works. There's lots of innovative stuff going on. Incentives, great incentive programs, but as I mentioned, they could use some work. And the last is procurement. As Joanne mentioned, we have a terrible way of procuring design. We think of design the same way we do toilet paper. There's 12 or 20 brands that'll do the job, pick the cheapest one, and that's how they procure design services in the city of Hamilton and in many municipalities. So that has to be examined too. So why is this culture so important? Because the study of behavioral economics shows us that market decisions and one of the biggest motivators of how people behave is what others are doing. If there's quality around, people will tend to build, build quality. And this is illustrated by, by Lock Street here in Hamilton, where you can see that uh, um, the, uh, the current fabric is becoming higher and higher quality with better restaurants and better products as it develops. No one would dare put a stucco uh, fast food joint there because it wouldn't work. So um, the World Design Capital Program was established in 2008 and gives biannual awards to recognize innovative cities for the use of design as a tool for social, cultural, and economic developments. So if our best efforts are put towards the establishment of a positive and supportive design culture, Hamilton might be that city in one day in the future. Thank you.
like to thank our speakers. I even learned a few things, and I've been talking this for years. Um, I'd just like to say I'm very pleased to, to hear the wonderful things that are happening here in Hamilton. I can say that uh, I grew up uh, just west of here, at the western end of, of Highway 5 in Paris. And uh, to me in the 60s and 70s, if you wanted to come to see things and do things, you came to Hamilton. And I'm glad to see that Hamilton is actually rebounding uh, 40 years later, and it's now a place that I want to come back to. So uh, I want to thank all the speakers and thank all the innovative thought that they've brought forward uh, that we can enjoy and talk about through the evening. Yes, uh, thank you all so much for the courage to participate in this format. Uh, thanks, Bill, uh, and thank you to the Ontario Association of Architects. Again, we thank the uh, Hamilton Burlington Society of Architects, the Renew Hamilton Project, an initiative of the Hamilton Chamber of Commerce, uh, our friends here at Bill's Hardware, and for the organizers of the event, Kim Graham and Associates, thank you very much uh, for all of that. And thank you again for Supercall for hosting this talk. Uh, we obviously have a thirst uh, for discussion uh, in this community, uh, as we can see here, so we need to continue uh, to keep the conversation going. Um, and if I may be so bold, uh, I actually have a little bit of an announcement, a pre-announcement to make um, for the Hamilton uh, Chamber of Commerce. We, we did, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Jennifer Kiesman, we brought her here uh, last December for our first annual Ambitious City. Um, since I took over at the Chamber, I've been working really hard to uh, bring Nahi Nenshi, the Mayor of Calgary, here uh, to Hamilton. And I am about 90% secure in saying that uh, he's going to be here October 23rd. Um, so we're not going to have much time to, to uh, promote it. I don't even have a venue yet, uh, but I expect you all to be there uh, because uh, you must. And, uh, but anyway, this is all kind of hush-hush. Uh, <laughs> But, I mean, I want to take the opportunity. When I have you here, I need to tell you uh, that you need to be there. But anyway, just to monitor the, the Chamber's website uh, and our other communications channels, and uh, you will see something uh, pretty soon on that. Uh, so, you have had your mental workout for the weekend. We can now crawl hard. Uh, I, uh, I expect you to do so. The bar is open. Uh, the uh, speakers are here available for your questions. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>